Romans chapter 12, verse 19. Do not take revenge, my friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Amen. Imagine your eight-year-old son tells you that when the teenager next door was babysitting last night, they played a game where they had to drop their pants. After a while, the babysitter said not to pull them up again. How do you feel? What do you do? What do you say to your neighbor the next time you see them? Or imagine you're walking along the street when suddenly in front of you stands your wife hand in hand with another man. Despite all her protestations that she'd simply grown tired of the marriage, there in flesh on flesh evidence before your eyes is the proof that someone else has lured her away. What do you say? Or standing before you in the town square is a man proclaiming that the grenades which were thrown into and detonated in your church that very morning were the will of Allah. Several of your best friends are at that very moment struggling for life in the local hospital, their bodies maimed for singing the praise of Jesus. What would you do? Or suppose tomorrow your boss calls you into the office. To your surprise, another colleague is already there. The very same colleague you found stealing office property last week and warned that he should stop or you would need to report him. But it's not him who's under investigation, it's you. Your boss informs you that serious allegations have been made against you And while they're investigated, you are suspended from work with immediate effect. And your colleague sits in the corner of the office, grinning like a Cheshire cat. What's your reaction? All of them? Real situations? Perhaps not the situations that Paul had in his mind when he penned these last few words at the end of Romans chapter 12, but certainly real situations to which Paul's words apply. Do not take revenge, my friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. These are demanding words. How do we fulfill them? When all your natural impulses are to hit out, to scream, to seek revenge, but God's word echoes quietly in your hearts, do not take revenge, my friends. It seems to me there are in these last three verses three thoughts that may help us in such times to react appropriately uh, and in a way that honours the one whose name we seek to honour. The first is this, remember who you are. Is it coincidental that Paul puts this warm, endearing phrase, my friends, here in this verse? Do not take revenge, my friends. If you know anything about Paul, and anything at all about the Holy Spirit, you'll realize there's no such thing as coincidental. The words are there quite deliberately. They're words that appeal to his hearers, his listeners, to us. They put the brakes on us. But more importantly, they call us to another reality. When the natural instinct is to rush round, batter down the door, confront, accuse, because that's how wounded people respond and that's how victims fight back. These words make us stop and think. 
my friends. Who is friends? Paul's friends? Yes, but more. If you're reading an old translation, you will have in words in front of you, not the words my friends, but the words beloved, beloved. That's what the word uh, really is. Beloved by who? Paul? Yes. But God. Beloved by God, more importantly. It's a phrase that's very popular in the writings, particularly of John, and uh, through his first epistle, every time you see these words in the NIV, my friends, it is in the old translations and in the original, beloved. And it's a reminder. It's a reminder to in to us in these verses. And it's a reminder to us as victims of other people's evil, of another identity that is true of us. You're not just a victim. You are beloved. I often think that's how name calling functions in the New Testament. Think of these people. Zacchaeus. Imagine all the kind of names he was called in the streets of the town where he lived. Thief, miser, loner, wee man, and that's probably the only ones I'm allowed to repeat. But Jesus looks at him. Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus. That's his identity. Not what everyone else throws at him. Not the other names they call him. Jesus calls him by his name. Or Mary. How was she that morning in the garden? Lonely? Broken hearted? Mournful? Distressed? All these things we might say are true of her. They shape her that morning. But Jesus speaks to her. Mary. here you and I are sometimes, our friends sometimes and we feel ourselves to be victim, bruised hurt think how people sometimes write into newspapers you know, distressed of Tunbridge Wells, you know if you read the Times that is it's the daily record that say, you know mournful of Pollock Shields or something how people describe us. And we sometimes feel that by the circumstances of life. And here Paul, when he's addressing us in those circumstances, wants to remind us of another reality, a truer reality, a more substantial reality, when he says to us, Beloved, that's who you really are. Remember that. Think of yourself in this term. This is the truth of your life. Don't let this action, this evil done to you, define your life and determine your actions. Let this other truth, the really real about your life, let it shape your identity and nourish your response. Beloved. And when we think of ourselves in that way, and we allow that to be the defining reality of our lives rather than slings and arrows that others have thrown at us, we begin to respond in a different way. So remember who you are. Secondly, rejoice in God's promises. Paul quotes the scriptures of the Old Testament. It is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. Do you remember? Some of you probably still have, as I have, the little Gideon New Testament you possibly got at school or you've uh, uh, picked up somewhere else I was going to say accidentally put it in your bag when you were in hospital but I'm sure none of you did that and uh, in the front page there it used to have those little things I still have it there when in sorrow gives you a verse when in trouble gives you a verse when distressed gives you a verse when evil is done to you maybe this is the verse that's in Paul's mind from the scriptures when evil is done to you it is mine to avenge I will repay It's the way of wisdom, isn't it? When everyone else is shouting their opinions as to how you should react and the course of action you should take, that we stop 
and recall what God's Word says for us in that situation. And this really is where the rubber hits the road for Bible-believing Christians. It's when the heat is on and when the pressure is up that uh, the reality of whether we are Bible-believing Christians comes out. That we really take the Bible seriously and we do what the Bible says, we do what God says. And if we don't in those moments, then our affirmation that this is the truth, this is the Word of God is compromised. It's possible when something is done wrong to us, like in any of those four examples I gave you at the beginning, to think that God has forgotten us. He hasn't protected me, so he must have forgotten about me. And if he's forgotten about me, then I need to take things into my own hands. Isn't that the way, somewhere in our subconsciousness, we begin to react when evil is done to us? That's where the knowledge of God's word matters so much. Because God has never promised that we will not face trouble or persecution, that we will have some divine immunity from evil in this world. He has promised that those things will not conquer us, and he has promised that those things will not separate us from his love. But we need to remember rightly what God has promised and what he's not promised and bring it to bear on the situation of our lives. And the first thing Paul does by bringing this verse to mind and encouraging us to do likewise in these circumstances is to bring a right perspective on the trial or trouble that we face. But the second thing he's doing is that he's reminding us here of a promise that God is righteous. Nothing goes unnoticed. Nothing is overlooked by the divine one. God sees what has been done to us. He sees what's been done by us. And he will deal with it in his way and in his time. And he will deal with it appropriately, with justice. That's part and parcel of who God is. Mine to avenge, I will repay. That's what leaving room for God's wrath means verse 19 it doesn't mean stand back because uh, God will strike an even mightier blow on these terrible people than you are capable of doing it means he will deal rightly with them you and I might not we often get our sentencing wrong in the courts with people who are very experienced in these things so what chance are you and I who maybe face these circumstances once or twice in our life of getting a right response. So we often react inappropriately. But God's judgment is measured. It's perfect. It's appropriate. It's right. So we leave it there. We recognize it's His place. We remember and rejoice in His promises that He will act justly and righteously in every situation. Thirdly, we want to respond to God's commands. A number of commentators point out, and I think we've seen this in the last uh, two or three weeks, that these final verses of this chapter, the last half dozen verses, are very balanced in terms of the positive and negative things that Paul says to us. Verse 14 do not curse, positively bless. Verse 17, do not repay anyone evil for evil, positively do what is right. As far as it is possible, live at peace. Verse 19, do not take revenge, positively leave it to God's wrath, and if your enemy is hungry, feed him. Verse 21, do not overcome, do not be overcome by evil, but positively overcome evil with good. I'm glad that that balance is in there. And it's important that we work it into the fabric of our lives, 
Christian living is never simply a matter of negatives, not doing certain things. That is a myth of the devil. Christian living is the most positive thing in the whole world. It is the cultivation of graces in our lives as much as the uprooting of weeds. And it's possible for us to be so engrossed with our sins, so preoccupied with the avoidance of that which is wrong, that all we are is dull. It is rather when we are taken up with the good, with doing what pleases God, when that becomes our passion, that our lives begin to sparkle and to shine for the glory of God. We're aware that in the international scene, in terms of uh, warfare and so on, there are several what are called neutral states. Uh, I think Norway is Norway one. The Republic of Ireland is one. There is no such thing in spiritual terms or in spiritual warfare as a neutral state. We mustn't remain neutral in the fight of good and evil. We need to stand underneath a banner and fight for a cause. So not taking revenge is not the sum total of our duty as Christians when we suffer evil. We are to go one step further. If your enemy is hungry, feed him. So we're not to accept defeat, overcome by evil, so let's respond in kind and kick back in evil. Nor are we to settle for neutrality. Well, I wouldn't do them any harm. We're actually to go on the offensive for Christ and for his kingdom and do as Jesus commands. And when we do that, it has a powerful effect. This is a, quite a difficult verse, the end of verse 20. Its meaning is unclear. You will heap burning coals on his head. You can read uh, ten commentators and find ten different interpretations, probably. I think uh, for myself, the best one in terms of the context is the thought that uh, we may bring them to a sense of shame and repentance by our love and uh, by the antithesis of what they have done to us. But there are possibilities uh, other than that in the commentators, and you may want to take time to read through some and come to your own conclusion, but, but it's clear that Paul is saying that our actions has an effect on them. And I found that to be true. A friend of mine whose husband left her, or someone else told me I pray for him every night and it's the only place in which I allow myself to think of him in God's presence because I then can't allow myself to think bitterly towards him and how her life bore witness eventually in his this remarkable testimony many of you are familiar with and know Leslie Belinda who went to Rwanda and married and then had her husband killed in the mass genocide and remarkable story of God in her life and through her listen to these words of Leslie's from a trip of return to Rwanda and she came across so many people who were devastated by the genocide. In the midst of such devastation there was courage, hope and compassion. I spent a morning with Marion, a dear elderly friend who along with her husband had been a great support to Charles and me as we adjusted to our cross-cultural marriage. She recounted to me the events that had led to the death of her own husband, her own son, her daughter-in-law, and all the other members of her family. Some 40 relatives had been murdered, she calculated, and her home in Gahini destroyed. 
And yet, as she shared her experiences with me over several hours, I was struck by the total absence of any resentment or any desire to take revenge. Instead, she was thanking God for the opportunities he was giving her to work among the war widows of both tribes, seeking to bring comfort and hope as she had experienced it herself. The contrast of this serenity and hope against the backdrop of horror was too deep for words. A man called Ali Sugu was uh, one of the first Christians, one of the first converts from Islam to Christianity in his country and in his own village in particular. And he was arrested and kept in solitary confinement for three months. He was then brought before the village court, which consisted of everyone who was in the village, with the village chief in the chair, and told they had three options. He could accept a life sentence of solitary and confinement. He could accept immediate death. Or he could accept being deported to another country. As a father of eight, found that a very difficult thought. So before these people he knelt and audibly before his whole village community he prayed these words, Lord Jesus, do these people good and make your love known to them. The village chief declared him to be insane and ordered his release. Three years later, 118 members of that village community had become Christians. If your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. Impossible, you say. To the one who abused my child next door, to the man who took my wife, to the one who picked on me for an honest testimony in the office, Naturally speaking, yes. Until we remember that when we were God's enemies, Christ fed us, watered us? No. When we were God's enemies, Christ died for us. Is it too much then for you and I to feed our enemy when they're hungry or to give them something to drink when they're thirsty? There is no doubt that these words are radical and they're an example of how radical the Christian ethic is. And repeatedly through this chapter we've realized that, haven't we? As we've been brought face to face with this... uh, multi-dimensional love that has been shed abroad in our hearts and which should be expressed in our hearts as Christ dwells there by faith. We've realized, have we not, that the love that Paul is describing in this chapter is of an altogether different kind from that which this world knows and celebrates and promotes. And I want us to finish this series and... uh, tonight's talk by recalling some of the features of this love as it's been described to us in the chapter. Let me take you through them one by one. I think we'll maybe do four or five. First thing I think we've seen on more than one occasion is that Christian love, as it's described in this chapter, is responsive love. We began in the very first verse with these verses in view of God's mercy. And now here in this very final uh, little section, we're we're, we're, uh, trying to learn what it means that we are beloved. We love because he first loved us. 
And so it's only as the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts that we love like God because we are moon-like and not sun-like. We don't have the ability to radiate something from ourselves. We're made to reflect something that is given to us. And so Christian love is responsive love. And if we are struggling to love, like Romans chapter 12 describes, then it is most likely because we've not appreciated the grace and mercy and love of God. I had written these words down, but a friend of mine talking to me last night uh, said about her church, I've realized, we've realized as a church, as God has brought more and more people to us in recent months, that our church is full of elder brothers who have done their duty to God all their lives. But it's those who know themselves to be prodigal, to be wasters, to be squanderers, to be undeserving, to be unlovely, and yet have found mercy streaming from the Father. It's those people who appreciate the Father's love and reflect it back. Well, God pity us if we've been here so long that we're more like the elder brother than the prodigal son. That we've lost our appreciation for the Father's love. Because if we have, we'll never love like this because Christian love is responsive love. Secondly, Christian love is thoughtful love. How often has the theme of our mind and our thinking emerged in this chapter? I know every time I've been preaching, it seems to have been there and I've been struggling to make it fresh because the same kind of ideas are coming up. And yet how little... A little thinking I sometimes put into my Christian life. I was with uh, a couple whom I was uh, conducting their wedding for a while ago. And they said to me, we'd, we'd like... Uh, they weren't really in the heart of church. They were very much fringe people. We'd like that reading about love, they said, in 1 Corinthians 13. Everyone likes that at their wedding. She said, but I've only got an old Bible here, she said, and, and I don't like it, she said, because it doesn't mention love at all. It keeps talking about charity. I said to her, when you're charitable to somebody, are you not showing them love? She said, oh no, she said. I just think they're sad. I don't feel any love for them. What she meant was she didn't feel for them like she felt for her fiancé who was sitting beside her. And she made the mistake of thinking that this feeling that I have for this man, this is love. And that's the sum total of it. Well, it may well have been love, but it doesn't exhaust love. And all of us need to be more thoughtful in our loving. And if we're going to love like this uh, description here, one another, and beyond these four walls, it's going to begin here in the renewal of our minds and with thoughtfulness. Do you remember David in uh, 2 Samuel 9? Is anyone left? of the house of Saul that I may show kindness for Jonathan's sake and little Mephibosheth with uh, the disabled legs is brought forward and brought into the palace and he eats at the king's table for the remainder of his life did he feel love for Mephibosheth well we're not told but we're told that because of his love for Jonathan, 
he wanted to express to his family. There was great thoughtfulness there. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, Christ's love compels us. And in that situation, he's not speaking about the sitting beneath the cross and our hearts being melted emotionally by the cross. He's speaking about the logic of the love of Christ on the cross. And for so many of us, it's the logic of love that's missing from our lives. Is there anyone? Should be our thought, our waking thought, our daily thought. Is there anyone to whom I can show kindness for the sake of Jesus today? That's thoughtful love. And that's the character of the Christian love described. Thirdly, Christian love is, according to this chapter, with feeling love. Now you're probably saying, now you're getting us tied in knots. One minute you're saying it's up here, and the next minute you're saying it's in here, if not down here. Well, I think I'm only repeating what uh, Paul says here. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. It begins with the renewal of our minds. But when this love of God takes hold of us, it reaches parts that no other love touches. It reaches the ducts from which our tears flow, and it reaches the muscles by which our hands and our arms operate. Christian love is with feeling love. When Jesus saw the crowd, He was filled with compassion because they were harassed like sheep without a shepherd. Jesus looked at him, the rich young ruler, and loved him. Jesus, when the twelve when they when the the, the disciples returned from their mission and they told of uh, the work that had been done, Jesus, full of joy prayed to his Father in heaven. Or those momentous moments by the tomb of Lazarus, as John records more than once, Jesus deeply moved. As it might literally be translated, Jesus snorted with indignation. He felt this death and he wept for this family. He was a man of affection. He knows burning anger and he knows vulnerable love. And one of the litmus tests of my heart and your heart and of our church today must surely be, can we look out on the lost souls of Moodisburn or Berry now and feel nothing? Not rejoicing with them or mourning with them, but just living beside them. Christian love is with feeling love. There was a story in the Herald yesterday, I only glanced at it, you maybe read it in more detail than I, but it's, uh, it's where the folks from the YF are going this summer. There's a young boy in a cot. Did you see him? Twelve years old. And that's been his whole world for twelve years. A cot. That's all he's known. Since Ceausescu was overthrown and the country was supposed to be liberated, twelve-year-old boy in a car for twelve years, just one of so many. How we should rejoice that God has given to some among us with feeling love for such people, and that he's thrusting out from among us others this summer the various parts of Europe and for the children in our own neighborhood that oh that God might give us with feeling love for the crowds today that are like sheep without a shepherd fourthly Christian love is active love it begins in thinking It emerges in our passions, but it does things. If a man's gift, you'll remember, we we read these words, if a man's gift is this, let him do it. 
Do it. Use it. Share with God's people who are in need. And tonight, if your enemy is hungry, pray for him. Sure. Feel sorry for him. Feed him. It's active. It's a doing word. Martin said last week, I think it, it's reactive sometimes. And it's proactive sometimes, but it's certainly active. It does something, it gets up out of a pew, and it touches people, and it affects their life. Christian love is active love. Finally, Christian love is self-controlling. Over and over again in this chapter, there's been this balance about if we're going to be these kind of people then it changes our attitude and it maybe begins with a change of attitude to ourselves don't be conformed any longer be transformed know God's will don't think of yourself more highly than you ought don't be proud don't be conceited don't repay evil don't take revenge don't, overcome, don't be overcome by evil there's a whole stream of thought in there about self-control. When we love ourselves, we massage our ego, we feed our ego, we boost our ego until it grows bigger and bigger, until it's quite out of control, one huge outsized ego that no one matters in my world but me. When the love of Christ informs me and shapes me and nourishes me, I matter less and less. I think less and less about myself. I put myself lower and lower on the agenda. So after all these weeks of studying, phrase by phrase this chapter let me ask you are you higher or lower on your own agenda since we started this series just after Easter has your agenda changed at all you plan your week I don't know whether you get a sheet out on a Monday morning plan your time to your time off has it changed at all because of this because of this map that's been put before us of what Christian love looks like in our individual lives and in our corporate lives has your agenda changed at all as God looks on you tonight, in the words of the song we sang earlier together, is there anything in you and in the change that's happening that makes Jesus turn and say to his Father, truly, my suffering was worth it all. Those words went to to my heart as we sang tonight particularly as I thought about these last 10, 12 weeks here, and wonder if the way God has opened up his word week after week to us if as he looks at me tonight he feels all this effort in speaking to us has been worth it in what he's seeing in my life Is this beautiful, multicolored love described here, present in Jesus? Is it refracted in your life anymore? Is it producing these wonderful colors and patterns in your relationships and in your lifestyle?
love. Love is patient. Love is kind. It doesn't envy and it doesn't boast. It isn't proud. It isn't rude or self-seeking. It's not easily angered and it keeps no record of wrong. Love does not delight in evil but rejoices with the truth. Love always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. 